Okay, so we're going to go lo-fi here, and we're going to do a uh, reaction to Les Stroud on GQ. GQ does these series, and there's a bow hunter one I want to do too, because I want to rip that guy apart too. Um, but uh, Les Stroud, if you don't know, is the survivor man, some supposed survival expert, and uh, kind of like uh, Bear Grylls, he's a fucking idiot. So... They have these experts on to break down scenes in movies. And one of my biggest uh, problems I have is they, they act like they forgot it's a movie. And sometimes you just have to have this you know suspension of disbelief for a movie. So I'll call them out on some of those too. But in particular today, we're going to look at his horrible survival advice. Now, I have to say that I did watch one and a half of the movie reviews that he did, and at that point I got pissed and had to turn it off. So the first one and the second one I saw part of the second one. Um, part of the first one, there's part that I'm not going to call out until the second one, and it has to do with bears, and you'll understand why. So, let's see this idiot talk. Territory where we're putting you. She has some cubs. She's killed 22 people this year. But it's okay, she's only eaten 12 of them. Okay, well then that's great. My husband stay out of that Anna area, Stroud, then. also known as Survivor Man. And this is the breakdown. This is Into the Wild. Interesting movie, by the way. This kind of frantic sort of crawling around behavior, that is accurate. That does happen, home, yes. You might want to run to a bathroom you or do run get outside. Absolutely delirious, state, which actually comes into another part of this movie. Dehydration, even that right there. You think you could drink water to make it feel better, but when you have poison in your stomach, mm -hmm. even water in your mouth is going to feel like poison. It's going to feel painful. That's so true. Actually not swallowing the so water he is correct about that. Spawn. The thing about trying to identify wild edible plants through books, you could have nine books in front of you with photographs and line drawings and descriptions. You will just never, ever be 100% certain. There is only one way to learn wild plants, and that's to have a teacher there showing you. When... That is somewhat correct. However, the problem with that is when you have a teacher in an area like that, you're most likely familiar with that area and aren't going to end up in a survival situation in that area. You're most likely going to end up in a survival situation in an area you're unfamiliar with. There is actually techniques for learning to eat wild plants while you're out in those situations. And I'm not going to go into them in this video, but there are techniques you can use um, to learn what you can eat in the wild. And it's not having a teacher. Because again, if you have a teacher for that area, you'll probably already know the area well enough that you're not going to be in a survival situation. Somebody says to you, yes, pick it. Oh, go ahead and eat it. Oh, you're too shy. Okay, here, I'll show you. See, as soon as you see somebody else put it in their mouth, you go, okay, I guess it's all right. When you start to learn what an edible wild plant is, mouth, you huh? start to pay okay. attention to all of the nuances of plant morphology. The leaves, are they spiked? Are they smooth? Are they basal? Are they around the stem? There's all these different descriptions. Now that is somewhat true as well. Plant morphology can give you a good indication of what you can and can't eat, but it's not entirely 100% accurate. Maple leaves, for example, they come to points at the end of them. Some of them do. Some of them are a little bit more rounded, like an elm, but like a five-pointed elm. But it doesn't guarantee anything. Of course, holly is very dangerous. Leathery type leaves, generally as a rule, not safe. Uh, waxy type berries, again, generally not safe. And that's what he's doing right here. Oh, lateral veins. So yeah, not 100%, but still close. You can learn a lot from that, that. from so learning morphology day, without an expert there. Taste tests a plant until I've been able to find somebody that knows. I'm doing mushroom season, and I go out with friends. I go with guys who really Now, mushrooms, that is true. Be very careful about mushrooms. In the case of wild edible plants, most poisonous plants will just make you sick, maybe make you vomit. But we're dealing with an individual not who's in the case of mushrooms, they can and very well a larder full of kill food. you. Then well, even eating the wrong plant they will shut down your liver for a day or two. So. 
That's don't it. eat mushrooms in the and wild, unless you absolutely know 100% This is going to come back as a refrain, the use of the grizzly bear. When you start to get into states of starvation, things become very surreal, which is why when this bear yes, showed up, that's I true. wasn't sure if this was supposed to be a dream. The concept of a bear like that just walking by is, no, that's not going to happen. Um, first off, that's not entirely true. Uh, there are cases where bears have just walked past people. If you don't freak out, they might just walk past you. That's going to come up in the next video to or in the next uh, movie he reviews. Um, but yeah, I do believe again the suspension of disbelief. I believe that scene in the movie was meant to just reflect how crazy and surreal things can be when you're out there starving to death. The likely case scenario is the bear is not going to come close. It's going to more than anything stay away from him. Depends on if it's hungry or not. I think Sean Penn handled. Depends on how long it's known you there too. Of the wild edible plants and the books and the identifying very well because it is confusing and the bottom line the moral of the story don't do it don't eat it if you don't know 100 percent yeah, starve to death instead of learning how to actually test Chris, it i think he was probably a very wonderful man a lot of people liked him he's been deified almost at this point but he was a terrible survivalist he didn't know anything oh, so are you less experiences where if you really pay attention and check out his story the truth is he always got out of things by somebody else pulling him out somebody always kind of now in most survival situations guess what you're not just going to walk out of the woods and hitch a ride home. You are going to get pulled out by someone else pulling you out. That's a stupid thing to say. In genuine survival situations nowadays, you are waiting for a rescue. That's dumb. I helped him out of bad situations. When he got up to Alaska, there was nobody there to save him. He was probably a very charming, very well-spoken yeah, man. Alaska's Alaska a big damn place. Crap at the charm. I don't nope. believe Chris had to die. I think with a few bits of knowledge, he could have gotten by there. He could have done things much differently. Yeah. I know in the story, he has a moose and it spoils on him. There were so many ways he could have had that moose last him the entire time he was there. Well, he, he doesn't know food preservation know techniques. He'd drown this in the, the this I actually like this movie. I purposely didn't watch it based on the poster alone. Imagine... I you are a like lawyer, the movie. It's actually your pretty cool. Is a doctor, and they make a TV show out of it. You know, you sit there going, "No, that's what I do when it." Oh, this is what I do when I watch you, Les. Comes <laughs> to survival films. If it's really that cold, I know he's got a little bit of the hand up to the mouth thing. The thing that you want to protect the most is actually your head. Eighty percent of your heat is lost through your head. I'm I can't believe people are still touting that bullshit lie. If that were true, in a survival situation, in the snow, you'd be able to cover your head and your upper chest and still be able to survive. You wouldn't die of hypothermia. If that were the truth, if 80% of your heat loss came through your head, you would be able to survive just by covering your head and leaving the rest of your body naked. But that's not true. That's not true whatsoever. That's a bullshit lie. It's still being touted, and it pisses me off like none other. Other than that, he is, you know, you still should protect your head because your fucking brain, your ears, you know, everything is very susceptible to cold up there. So you still should, but you do not lose 80% of your body heat through your head. That's a proven fucking lie. I mean, I'm bald. And so for me, a cap in the wintertime is just vital. Otherwise, I really lose because you ate that plant right someone there. told you. Do you see any footprints of him walking up to that spot? No, again, it's a movie. It's suspension and disbelief. This is place. when Hollywood just doesn't get it. All of that snow around him. Who that gives a shit about the details? It's the story. Right? The camera crane or something. Here, we're going to put you down there and then we're going to film the scene. Or it was fake snow that they spray around, you know, because that's how they do a it. A grizzly bear of that size can sneak up on you that quickly and that's how. I don't know which bear this is in, in Hollywood terms. It's probably Bart. Bart the bear is a famous bear used in so many films nicely groomed bear by the way what we're about to see is a bear attack and a very silly one and that grizzly is going to come after you they run full you steam, things, yeah. super fast much faster than you can and a lot of times their back two legs will go in unison because they're really okay first thing yes a grizzly can sneak up on you i know someone that it happened to while he was hunting grizzlies literally came through some grass and was face to face with one didn't kill him he was able to actually shoot it and kill it and survive that situation now, this is again where some of these experts really bug me in that, the, again, the suspension of disbelief. Get over it. It's a movie. You know it's a trained bear. You know the name of the goddamn bear. And you're talking about how it's not running correctly. Oh, it's a fucking movie, Les. They're not going to have the thing actually chase the guy and kill him. Pushing at it. So what we have here is an acting bear 
lollygagging along behind they them. They use acting bears snow. for movies. It's just like they the use real actors for movies. Amazing. Bear attack is to play dead. The way I look that is not true. First off, yes, again, like I cited in the guy that I knew, grizzly bears can't come upon you very quickly like that. You, you know, you'll just look up and bam, there they are. They come out of the bush or you come out of a bush and there they are. That is true. However, most of the time they don't. And even then, when a bear moves towards you, and Alaska guides have proven this over and over again, playing dead is not the key. Standing there and not running is the key. Most grizzlies will not attack if you stand and don't move. If you don't believe me, look it up. This is, again, a proven method of preventing a bear attack. Now, if you do happen to come upon one face to face and it does actually attack you because it panics, playing dead, I don't think that's going to be the best bet. I, you know, I, you, they always tout that, but in reality, it's probably just going to eat you if it thinks you're dead because it's hungry at that point. Um, it's not what I would recommend. If you got something sharp, I'm not even joking. Stab at it. Stab at its neck. Stab at its eyes. Stab at its ears. Anything to hurt it and make it feel like you're winning a fight, and then it will run off. That is a genuine thing. Um, there have been men uh, back in the day on the frontier here, or what was the frontier in North America, who had come across grizzlies and killed them with a knife and even been mauled and survived and these are men out in the middle of nowhere the best thing to do the most likely to survive is to fight back sorry my dog sees a squirrel or another dog uh oh okay the predators we have what i think are accidental predators and apex predators the apex predator are those creatures on this planet that truly would like to eat us. Great white shark would truly like to eat us, not because we're prey or they want to find us or anything like that, but because they're kind of haphazard eaters. They'll, they'll taste test stuff. But the way you react to a predator is going to be different each time. With a grizzly, you don't stand a chance. You can't outrun it. Actually, you literally you stand and, and you have a chance. Them. They may taste test you while they're getting bored, which means you might have to put up with a chomped hand or something. But you keep all the extremity. Yeah, play dead while something's trying to eat you. That is fucking stupid. You're not going to do that. You curl up into a ball and you get boring and you play dead. That said, would you That's or I happen. run? Damn straight we'd run. No, <laughs> I wouldn't run. I can sit here and say I, I wouldn't. Play dead. That's because I know how to handle a bear. <laughs> Anecdotal story. When I first moved to Tennessee... <laughs> Sorry, my fiance is laughing at me. I was out in the woods hunting for bow woods. And... This is going to be TMI. Had to take shit and found some maple leaves, found an old log, sat over the log, taking a dump, wipe. As I stand up with my pants still down, a brown, uh, a black bear, a smoky, smoky Mountain black bear, came out of the fucking bushes and ran past me. Apparently, it did see me and freaked out and ran. Didn't know what I was. I didn't know what it was until it was too late. I really wouldn't have stood a chance. All I had was a knife on me and my hatchet um and my pants were down around my ankles my best bet would have been to fight back luckily i couldn't run i definitely couldn't play dead so i just stood there and what do you know the bear ran off so that is not going to run through those trees snapping them over what's going to happen is they're all green and growing and young they're all going to bend and be pushed to the side these things are snapping like again who cares suspension of disbelief you know what i guess i could throw a little kudos here to one thing if you are going to protect yourself from an animal that big so in this a is as far as i or got a jumble of big this. branches like that that actually is a smart thing to do just a little behind the scenes magic bart the bear and the other acting bears they never growl when a grizzly bear growls he truly is angry these guys are trained actors they've so again, you can kind of tell that Les Stroud is a bit of a bullshitter and that he knows enough about Hollywood to know which bear this is. Which means he's been involved in Hollywood long enough to know this shit. Not, he's not Talk the bear to just whatever hang he thinks open, he is. Or even open their mouth with all the saliva and the fangs. In reality, there's zero sound coming out of their mouth. They have to double that in later. He's a man killer. Oh, that's a pet peeve. He's a man killer. Oh my gosh. We've well, yeah, technically he is. Years. He tried to kill a man. Back in the days of uh, the movie Born Free. You know, is that tiger a man eater? Or is it just enacting its own survival? It's been the whole time. He's stalking us. 
the well, most of these if animals don't see a lot of bipeds, so, you know. Massive fire, I'm talking, like, six feet flames, do it. When they start throwing these torches, those torches are treated by the special effects unit so that they will not blow out as they throw them oh in the air. God. I've thrown lots of burning logs in the air. Sometimes they stay going. Most of the times they snuff out while they're flying. Yeah, anybody who's oh. messed with a fire knows that you keep it all contained, and that's how you get the fire. The but yes, do grow a big fire, and they are more likely to that stay away. happen with cats, not so much bears. Two guys, the fire, all of that. The bears just going to take off running. They're not going to hover around the outside growling. That's but we true. We always see them in Hollywood films growling. Generally like, true. Yeah, I'll, I'll get you. Unless it's super it's hungry, it might. Twenty-seven hours. Ooh. Okay, so I haven't seen this part of the video yet. That's really true, of course. When you're that dehydrated, even a sprinkle of rain, you're out there running around trying to catch the drops. This is a really nice depiction of flash flooding. I've seen rivers go up 20 feet in a matter of a couple of hours. And my canoes were about to get washed downstream. You can imagine how fast that is. And that's the danger of flash floods. They don't have to happen where you are. They just ha have to happen uphill from where you are. The thing about this is Aaron Ralston, who the film was made about, is an incredibly I mean, experienced a flash flood. Even though this is a dream sequence, the depiction of the reality on his face of what's going on water-wise is, is very real. People who do a lot of this kind of adventuring can recognize the signs, and he knows he's in a crevice that has a thousand crevices leading to it. And every single one of those crevices is about to become a stream. That's the crazy part about a flash flood. You have to see it to believe it. Because it's not like, oh, we got time. Let's walk out of the way. Let's go up higher. <laughs> Walls of water coming down the crevice. 15 this is why high ground's high. a good thing. They try to get out of the way of that. He could just say that. A little nuance that I like. They didn't have him calling for help. So often the scene in the film is already hopeless. It gets worse, and then they start calling for help. So if you haven't had help for 12 hours, all you wouldn't believe though what people will say. Yelling. And then that's a cool part. This is when. So I I don't like that little bit. I mean that's just a little probably a movie preference between him and I, but, um, yeah, people will still yell things. I mean, people who are dying will yell for their mothers. Uh, people who are in a desperate situation will yell help in the hope that there's someone out there that can help them, no matter how isolated they are. They will still do that. Rocks and big trees and logs get moved around. He doesn't because he's always got a camera crew with him. Given that kind of buoyancy and that force and push on the rock to move it so that in his dream he pulls his hand out. I have to be careful, but I don't have to be careful. Um, some of these films are made on real stories. So that one clearly is. That's Aaron Ralston's story, the 127 hours. The one thing during that movie I wanted to talk with him about was drinking his own pee for dehydration. And the reality is, no, that's a, that's a no-go. Like, no, I agree with that. Do not listen to Bear Grylls. Do truth, not drink your really own piss. Was a, was a sense of comfort. It's sterile, it but it's also high in salts. Himself, even though it's 92% water, but there's all the toxins and so on. But here's the missing it's link. Most of the time when you're not dehydrated, you don't pee. This is the office, a little bit. An episode actually called Survivor Man. Producers contacted me and said, "This Michael is great. Scott's going to go out and try to be you." I couldn't have been more honored. This is the highlight of my career. I've got the DVD at home. It's <laughs> the highlight of his career today. because it's he hasn't funny done anything how else. Right, Steve Carell got things. Now this way, I can't retrace my steps. I don't know what streets we met. <laughs> uh, I did that. I blindfolded myself and I had them paddle me into the swamp. He's mimicking of me. Someone should have hit him in the head with a shoe. So embarrassingly spot on. I was like, God, am I that cheesy? Am I that bad? Yes. Please yes, you allow are. me to have one cathartic experience in my life. There's a lot of weekend warriors. I love The Office, by the way. Exactly what this Michael is, just said. And this episode is hilarious. Playing Survivor Man. My favorite is actually when Dwight's watching him through the optic and he turns the safety on. See, perfectly safe. That happened to me. I've had my crew go. Are you sure, Les? Can we just like check in on you? I had to argue with my crew. Would you go to do they something? They always like do. He's not out there right? alone. It won't let you. In the Arctic, my one of my very first episodes. I had a, a hunter that watched me from afar through his gun sights. It was in the Amazon jungle, I had a, a native elder. Gosh, he kept showing up. I'm in the middle of the jungle, and I'm like, oh, catching some shrimp, and I'm filming. I'm doing this. I'm doing what Michael Scott's doing, and I'm talking to the camera, and I look over, and he's standing there. And he's just wanting to make sure that I'm okay. Because you're not in a survival situation because there's people there. can be used. The stupid part about this is it's going to be hard for me to critique this because he's copying this Batman episode, and he's kind of getting it right. So many... Episodes of mine. I oh, he looks like a fool, so yeah, something. I mean, he's spot he's on. Like that. In the Cook Islands, I cut off the bottom of my shirt to make a bandana. The guy's even admitting cool. how much of an idiot he is. It can be used for all sorts of... Okay, in a real survival situation, what you would do is you try to not damage anything that you have. That being said, no joke, pants, fabrics, you tie them up into a tube, you tie one end, 
you soak it and then fill it with water, it will hold water. You can actually use that as a water carrying device. Cool trick. Unless you can repurpose it for something better. Then you don't want to be squeamish about damaging something. Totally alone right now, with only my thoughts. But ideally, yeah, you want to keep as much clothes as you can, because it. shelter, there, clothes are a form of shelter, you really want to keep warm. Stuff. It's cathartic. If you're distraught, you might it's break down that and rise out. If you're angry, yeah. remember that argument you had three days ago in the airport on the way here? Ah, I can't believe that she said that. Ah, you get it all out when you're out there. You know, he made a mistake. I don't think I ever did that. And then he had to fix a mistake. When you're super hot at 2 p.m., you think everything's going to I did get a little delirious at one point, but I don't think I ever did that shit. Like, huh. But I also don't get the life flashing before your eyes thing that a lot of people get. Or, something. or in his case, got his pants I'll tell you what bugs me. Halfway through a Survivor episode, my crew will leave me alone for my seven days. And I know that on the day three, when I'm really hungry, they're having a beer and a filet mignon. I well, yeah, because they're not out there trying beer. to make a survivor of themselves. They're crew. I made a spear that wasn't much straighter than that in the Cook Islands one time, and I knew it wasn't going to work, but I had to do something. I had to A sharp stick you know is a sharp stick. You out there? Very little. Little grubby things. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, I highlight like catching a scorpion or... Now, that is true. Like that. That's what you really... That is true. Little living things are the best thing to eat. They tend to be actually really high in fat content, like mealworms and stuff like that. If you find big fat worms and squish them and all that guts come out, that's like pure fat. That's energy right there. Eat small grubby things, worms, bugs, stuff like that. I don't recommend venomous ones if you can avoid it, but you can't eat parts of them. So. Yeah, nobody runs and impales a rabbit. You don't accidentally come upon a, a <laughs> no, zebra that you can just trap eat because it's there in Africa with nobody touching it. Well, survival, Do not eat you that. grovel. I have been without Do not eat food a dead zebra. for a good you don't know how long three it's been hours there. or so. Probably now, that's hilarious. Could my kids say to me after two hours after lunch, Oh, Dad, I'm starving. It's like, you realize you've got the wrong father to say, I'm starving too. People think that three hours six hours without food and they're going to perish three days and you're still pretty lucid and three okay days in, without water water yeah. with food, three weeks you'll get lethargic food. the general but rules but you definitely want to eat do before that eating. it's yeah. green birthday today that's true happy birthday to you it's so michael is in the delirious phase that normally you get after a few like days that. not singing happy birthday just sitting there <sighs> okay you have to get your mind together. You have to think about what you're going to do next. It's actually a good thing. The truth about survival and survival situation and filming it is that real survival is really boring. You hardly do anything. You think about Somewhat true. Somewhat true. You should always be doing something, especially early on. A lot of people you see on these shows like Naked and Afraid, they're like, we need to conserve energy. Well, that's not how it works. Your energy is going to burn off whether you're laying there or doing something. So may as well try and do something productive early on. But Not an entirely true days, statement to make as a blanket episode. statement. You watch us 43 minutes across seven days. A lot of that time, nothing's happening. That's the truth and reality of a real survival situation. But yes, it's not extended situations, yeah, it is. You are out there action. just, just kind of bored. Kind of like the isolation we're doing this right now. It's like a pie. I read the book, but I read the book after I saw the movie. Never read the book, never saw the movie. You know, There's I don't a tiger know what and a bone, I know the that. difference between filmmakers when they try to depict certain scenes that actually happen in life. Some just do a silly job of it. Others nail it, and they make you feel every moment. And this is one of those films where you can feel that door opening underwater, and the pressure difference, everything. So far, so good. When frantic scenes like this happen, it's a very difficult thing to get right. You can take the camera and jostle it around like you're the character. You can slam it into walls and things, but too often Hollywood shows the, the missteps and the slips as ridiculously dramatic, which is fine if you're watching The Avengers. But if you're watching something like this, you know, you want it to be pretty spot on to Why, how someone would slip as real on as your the deck, how career. someone would catch themselves. What I love about this scene is how quickly the boat slips away from the main boat. When the storm is that crazy, you can be out of reach of your safety within a split second. I'll bet you in the brain it all happens in slow motion. But in real life, it happens this fast. With waves like that, uh, you're going to be tossed about. You're nothing more than a cork, really. I think they depicted him Somewhat being true. at the mercy of being tossed from yeah. a ship as perfect. You're just as likely to get slammed into the boat that was washed away. So far. I've been a, on the other side of a river with some basic rapids, not even <laughs> rushing rapids. And you yell, and the person on the other side can't hear you. Your voice does not cut That's through. Because the noise Storm, drowns out sound. Wind, and or it drowns out well your voice. Whistles do. 
That's why whistles matter in survival. They cut through the sound. They travel long distance a lot better than you yelling help. It's one of the reasons why I talk. Not only that, so one key thing he's forgetting to mention is they're not a natural sound. Voices, no matter how they're yelling, are at a similar pitch and frequency to other natural sounds. And that's why it actually gets drowned out. Whistles are at an extremely high pitch and frequency, so they're more likely to be heard at a long distance. And because they're an unusual sound, people will notice them more. Myself had a whistle. If I would whistle right now, I'd blow the microphones out. Now that little moment right there is very true. I've been in the ocean with crazy waves trying to get on board small vessels. It is often the wave that will get you on board. When you know them, you can kind of time it. You know, the boat's going up eight feet and down eight feet. You have to time getting on board that boat with the waves. So the tiger did it right. There's a few things going on here. Number one, him jumping ship. It's a fictional story, so I can't even speak to that one. Seeing the immensity of the wave above him, that's a pretty real thing to see. Going down below like this, the, the, the instant quiet, that's one of the things I love about diving. It can be crazy. Yeah, it's not so fun when you're out in the so ocean. It just goes quiet. But they did throw in sharks swimming by for dramatic. If you're, if, you know, it is a cool feeling, actually, that quietness. Um, it's usually followed by a very quick pickup sensation, like you lift it up out of the fucking water, and that's because uh, another wave is coming through and carrying you. It's a really interesting sensation. It is very quiet. Um, I had an incident in Hawaii one time where I almost broke my neck at a beach, and it was the same thing when it happened. It was so quiet. It was so bizarre. Um, but uh, that is somewhat true but i imagine in a situation where you're out in the middle of the ocean and these giant waves 40 or more foot waves are towering over you when it comes over you and it gets quiet you're probably not in this peaceful mode that he's talking about it is odd but imagine you're in a much more panic state yeah, and that's all that is, is dramatic my incident yeah, i was close to land so i knew i was going to be okay as long as my neck wasn't actually broken you can get down that low. You can which obviously it wasn't i've done it watching humpback whales this particular scene they did beautifully in life and die this is open water i've done a lot of shark dives i highly advise learning how to dive and diving with sharks it's one of the most amazing things you'll ever do in your life they're set up here People it's have been cool. forgotten. You like that With thing. different companies, the companies I don't know, especially local companies in small countries, I worry. They go out with 25 people, 26 people, and they don't do a head count. You don't, you're not paying attention to anybody else. You're looking at you your don't own do a head gear, count. And you're, you know, with your wife or your husband or your partner. <laughs> I will agree with him on that. If you go diving or hiking or anything like that, or trail, or you know, horseback riding, and they don't do a head count to begin with, leave and get your money back. another six times. A tiger shark might try to taste test the tank on your back. More testing of what these two things up there are by the sharks before an all-out attack. It has happened. A shark has come out of nowhere and attacked a diver before. That has happened. So rare compared to the amount of happen. hours that humans are in the water doing all of this, these activities. That's it's true. Beautiful shark. Shark, shark attacks are actually really rare. It actually does portray how he would probably react to that because you get angry when when you get in Florida and we're in, in fact, at the beach and we're out in the water a little bit and when we came off and went on this uh, pier and we were looking down I was like shit I was only 10 feet from where the sharks are swimming around. Didn't even know they were there. Now, right there, that big chunk out of his leg. Would a shark do that on the second bump? Highly unlikely. Except for the great white, most of the sharks are accidental predators. They may attack because of other reasons things are going on. You know, I mean, spear fishermen get attacked a lot because they've got dead fish all over them. My leg is still there, right? Yeah, I can feel it. Bad scripting. My leg is still there, right? The shark going after that little beacon there. It's been proven that sharks are actually attracted to the color yellow. Think about that when you buy your next wetsuit. And so the shark bumping that, I don't necessarily think the director meant that to be biologically correct, but it, it accidentally was, let's say. That's an interesting fact, I did not know that. Thank what you, Les. a Les. controversial subject. Pendulum has always swung the use of a tourniquet in a survival situation. For a while it was use a tourniquet, and it was never use a tourniquet. Was use a tourniquet, and it was never use a tourniquet. We're back to pretty much using a tourniquet if you've been given the proper instructions. So the that is true too that is something that has been debated back and forth so much but in reality without proper medical gear um, a tourniquet is still if you don't know that help is immediately on the way a tourniquet in a time of like a heavy wound or heavy bleeding is still your best bet for survival yeah you may end up losing the lower half of your leg but at least you won't bleed out
a deal with using a tourniquet is you learn how to do it properly just as you would get your CPR or your first aid training. So putting a tourniquet on him is a smart thing to do. Now I would have gone top of my thigh, just higher, just in the crux there. Nonetheless. Funny, I was actually just going to say almost the same thing. The misuse of a tourniquet though, people put it right above a wound. Um, if you've ever been in a medical emergency where they're trying to uh, stem blood flow to a certain part of the body, um, or uh, a very simple, simplified way of putting this. Uh, if you've ever had someone try, like if you had a knee injury, which I've had a couple, and they try and instead of icing the knee directly, they'll actually ice up your thigh closer to your crotch, and that cools the blood as it flows and brings the coolness down. That is correct. Stem the flow of blood earlier than the wound. Otherwise, the blood just kind of flows and pools up there. You want to keep it to where it can circulate with the rest of the body. Still the right thing to do. So he was correct on that one. Painful things you can ever feel in your life is a tourniquet. It hurts more than the shark bite. The first time I ever panicked under the water, my dive instructor. That can be somewhat true. Um, it's, for instance, uh, bullet wounds. People who have been shot will often tell you that it didn't hurt. That is somewhat true. Generally, the shock sets in almost immediately. Um, even if they know they're shot, generally the pain doesn't come till afterwards and a lot of people have said it's not as bad so that is somewhat true that probably a tourniquet would probably hurt more than natural wound. took my head and held it like that and then she went like this take his head and hold it underwater she just calmed me down and that's what's going on in this scene she's kind of doing the right thing in a survival situation with that much panic would there be more sharks uh you bet there would be they can smell i can't remember that is true in any situation it is best to like just try your best to stay calm sometimes, sometimes just stopping and thinking like there are is going the best to be different things you can do, do sharks calm. are like cats they do not want to attack you from the front so i mean in india i wore a mask on the back of my head so that a tiger wouldn't pounce on me from behind in the water when I see sharks, you want to make eye contact. Interesting, maybe a true fact about sharks and cats. Um, well, I know that big cats are, are like that. Um, wearing an actual mask on the back of your head so it thinks it's the front and not the back, I don't know if that would necessarily work considering that most predator-prey responses are based on movement, not actual detailed visual acuity. It's the moving away from them that causes them to generally, you know, attack you. Yeah, with a shark. Sharks don't want to attack your face. If I were her, I would have gone and just kept looking. Just make sure the shark. Now, someone can correct me on that if there. I'm wrong. The Please do. I don't know, but that just doesn't sound. Go to save yourself. Realistic. It lies entirely in what preparation did you do before this? What do you know? Do you know that you are two miles west from a whole archipelago do you know that you're a quarter mile east of a very large island do you know that do you know that this is something that bugs me a lot whenever i hear about survival situations especially on the continental united states most people who end up lost or stranded somewhere when they send out esar to go get them you're not more than a few hours walk away from anywhere know your direction know your orienteering learn how to find true north and what what landmarks roads cities towns villages, even local known farms or anything are in your area relative to where you are versus true north. Once you find true north, you can always find your way. There's very few places in this country that you will go on foot where you will end up in a survival situation if you set yourself out there to begin with. We're not talking about getting stranded in like a plane crash, an extreme case. Most situations where they go out to find people like lost hikers, they could have gotten out themselves in a few hours if they just stayed calm oriented and just got their ass back parents get all the information about what you're the hike you're about to do in peru the dive you're about to go on all of that information should be in your head not just the guide's head because what happens when you lose the guy you want to know where did you leave from the boat how far out are you can you make an attempt to swim to safety because i certainly would want to and two miles and far, yeah, go for it. information you need to stop that trip right there this is alive. Now, personally, I wouldn't go diving anywhere where I couldn't see land. I do like open water on a boat, but I would not go diving in open water that just with all the gear, even if you had to swim, I mean, you're going to have to ditch stuff. It's just a more complicated situation. Just don't go in open water diving. That's we're not meant to be out there. We don't have fins anymore. The dolphins took care of that. If we do this, we'll never be the same again. They still have fins. They're the ones out there, not us. 
their death. Sorry, Hannah know. gave me a weird look. People will understand. I know this story very, very well, like and I can assure you that the decision to <laughs> engage it. in cannibalism is not one you come by easily. If I beg to differ. This is something that I, I semi-joke about all the time. If you are the kind of person who is going to be in possible survival situations, this is one of the first things you should ever consider. Uh, one of your quickest food sources might be another human body. Um, I know it sounds crazy, it sounds insane, but if I were stranded on a mountain, snow-capped mountains, and there was dead people, gotta eat. And I wouldn't wait a long time, frankly, because you gotta get your energy up and keep it up to get out of that situation. Um, is it, you know, to say that you shouldn't take the decision lightly, that's... I don't completely agree with that. You may be in a situation where you just need to do it, and you just do it. I have you for three days or four days with no food, and I show you we can eat scorpions and creepy crawlies, and I eat one in front of you? He's talking about the movie Alive. Again, they were on snow-capped mountains. There's no insects up there, I promise you. Their only food source is people. You're not going to hesitate. Give me some of those, and you're going to eat. Cannibalism? Total different thing. Not in that situation. I completely disagree. Classic show again, here. again, he's making blanket, blanket statements about all survival situations, and that's not necessarily true. In their situation, there is no food on that mountain, period. The only food is dead bodies. You eat them. Don't fucking wait. Keep yourself alive. If, yes, you're in the woods, you know, if you're in the, in the Appalachian Mountains, there's snakes, there's squirrels, there's all kinds of things you can learn to trap and eat easy there's even medium-sized game and big game out here not that hard uh in the pacific northwest where i'm from same thing again snow-capped mountain though you're up there there's nothing you can eat not even the most of the plants so the very few plants you could get at that altitude if there are even any at the altitude they were at i can't remember exactly where they were aren't even edible blank stare from everybody these people thought they were going to be damned to hell some of these people struggled it's well after their ordeal i believe the pope even absolved them and assured them that they were still going to that's heaven. nice of him wow the psychological kickback from all this has been intense so i hate that to be technical about it but glutamus maximus if you're going to engage in cannibalism that's where all the meat is boy i don't mean any disrespect the reality is that the glutes are the most exposed easiest thing to get anything else uh, sort of true. The glutes contain more fat generally. These guys were soccer players, so probably not a lot. But gluteus muscles do indeed often contain more fat. Fat equals energy. Uh, thighs as well are very high in protein. So those are your two prime places. Essentially, the upper legs are the best place to get meat from a human body. Requires precision like surgery of going in and maybe getting organs and things like that. I mean, and think about how horrifying to say, you know what, we should eat the liver first. Uh, what you do I in go a for the kidneys if I got a fire. Is you try to dehumanize the body laying in front of you. An animal that you catch can be at one moment. I disagree because he talked a bit about the um, mental aspect of it and what happens afterwards, and that is true. People who have had to eat people generally do have a lot of mental issues afterwards, and a lot of them even will commit suicide years later. Um, part of that is, has to do with, in my opinion, is the coddling of it. If you just went to them and said, look, you, hear you were in a survival situation, you had to eat people, that's all there is to it, they'd probably be just fine. It's it's this bullshit whitewashing of it that's just really, I think, you know, it's one of those things, uh, it, to me, I don't want to say it in this way, but it's a very Western Christian idea. There's still cannibalistic tribes out there. They don't just eat people, but they do eat people. You know, it's not an inherent moral issue for a human in a survival situation. We create the moral issue. It doesn't inherently exist. We create it. And that's the problem in these situations. Moment, a cute and cuddly rabbit. And then when it's dead, it's a piece of meat you need to skin and roast. That's what they psychologically have to do. They have to take a look at the biggest muscle on the body, the place that is the farthest away from the humanism, the face. This is extreme survival. There's no question about it. Well, it's not I much ask, edible up here. Place to survive? What I'll say is, wherever it's cold, if it's cold, That's true. it's hard. You can't stop. If I'm in a really rugged area and there's jaguar around and poisonous things, 
but it's 75 degrees, I'm okay. I got forgiveness time. I can sleep by a tree, maybe. When it's cold, you can succumb. One of the things you see on a lot of survival shows that they don't get right is they start looking for food and water right away. Shelter is number one, because if you get cold, get hypothermia, you will die in hours. So he is correct in that. Cold is the hardest place to survive. Cold and wet, even worse. So quickly to hypothermia. When you don't have food in your system, what's there to keep your body engine warm? When it comes to cannibalism and any survival situation, you and I cannot judge a group of people on the verge of potentially never being rescued and potentially dying. I would never I'm judge them. Like I'd this. say that was a good can't choice. Judge unless you're there. Jeremiah Jackson. My favorite Ooh, movie not man. of all time. The uh, consultant on this film was uh, none other than Larry Dean Olson, one of the godfathers of survival. What follows are proper depictions of, of survival. And first little slice of realism is that this is the time of year. Now remember, in creeks like that. I've been in creeks Michael Scott had a realistic depiction of Les Stroud. Like crazy, bouncing off your legs. Now you might be asking, judge that why would he in this all versus wet like that. Well, he's a desperate mountain man mm. looking for sustenance. He's going after fish. Well, actually, no. This was an accidental find. He was trying to trap, but he sucks at it. This is the very beginning of the film, and this is the thing. We think we, we can just go up there and just be Jeremiah Johnson. You have to train. You have to learn these skills. If you're going to try and that is true. Reading a book once isn't going to make you survive this. Even when there's hundreds of them, it can be tricky. I thought maybe they're just busy about their business until I started doing it several times. Oh no, they know you're there. They swim away from you quickly. Why? Because you represent to them likely a grizzly bear. Anything big that's coming down along the water, they don't that's want to be around. So they try to take off. So it's very difficult. They're now, prey. what we're seeing here is going to set up the entire movie, which is his friendship with and then war with tribes that were in the area. That's a good look of disgust right there. Now, later on in the film, actually, when he bumps into that native leader again through translation, he says, You fish poorly. Uh, and he did. We're not looking at a seasoned mountain man yet. He's a wannabe. This scene here, I love this. Fire like a lot of survivalists. Again, I know that Larry Dean Olson was consulting, showing him this is how it actually works. With rock and steel and charred cloth, you take 100% cotton and you char it. And then if you put a spark on it, it catches the spark, holds the ember, you put that in tinder, you blow it to flame. That was their pack. That is generally you use char cloth to start a fire, but you don't need that. Uh, frayed cotton, cotton balls, tampons, uh, maxi pads, stuff like that. Will, any type of loose cotton will catch very easily. I've even had uh, cotton denim jeans that were frayed catch on fire while welding from one spark. Um, don't need a char cloth. That helps, but ladies especially if you're in a survival situation and you've got tampons or max pads, you've got a really good fire starter. If you want a really good one, get a toilet paper roll. There's going to be plenty of them right now. And take dryer lint, pack it full of dryer lint, and one spark will catch that, and that's a great start fire starter. Matches. That's not like rubbing two sticks together, which is even more primitive. Doing it with the fire bows goes back in time. Doing it with your hands goes even farther back in time, in different geographical locations. Yeah, the thing about the friction fire starting is, this, is much more complex than it's depicted yourself, in a lot of movies. Really take your time. I still don't understand today in regular camping how people can't get a fire going with matches and dry wood. It just baffles me. In the end, it's a I agree. Thing. Learn how to start a fire. Learn how to build a proper fire that will last blowing. hours, too. What's he done wrong? He's got no protection around him. He's not out of the wind. He doesn't have a big supply of wood beside him. You have to treat your fire like it's your baby. You can do that, you'll, you will get a great warm fire going. The thing that Jeremiah Johnson portrays beautifully is that the romanticism and the power of being out in the mountains or on horseback or in the wilderness alone is still very, very powerful. It's, it is a classic a movie experience. if you're interested in about wilderness survival, do watch it. Movie is playing Jeremiah Johnson in his head when he, when he watches I Could Do Die. Yeah. The thing about Jeremiah Johnson and his ability to live and survive in the wilderness is um, he's just not instantly good no. at it. It takes a no. long time. It comes down in the end, he's on the mountainside, and he's comfortable. And he's roasting no. a rabbit. The character he meets in the beginning looks at him and just says, You've come far, Pilgrim. My favorite line of all time, he just, without even uh, barely look at him, he no. just says, Feels like far. That encapsulates the journey of wilderness survival. It takes a long time, and when you get to the end of it, it doesn't feel like it went by fast. It does feel like it's been a, a long journey. You know, sometimes like, boy, that went right by. Not survival, not wilderness. You get That's to the true. end of it, you feel weathered, you feel tough, and you feel like you've been on a, on a long journey. That was my breakdown. Thanks for watching. Okay, one thing I'd like to say about Les Stroud as well.
one of the reasons I'm ripping on him for this so hard is one, he specializes in wilderness survival. He does know some things, obviously. I did say I agreed with him on certain things. Some things he is completely wrong on. I do not think he's a good survivalist to follow. And in times of this pandemic, I think he has been one of the worst people to listen to. But he's throwing his advice out there. Do not listen to him. Other survival experts even have called him out on it. And you just, he doesn't really know. He is trained in wilderness survival. He's not that great at it. And, you know, some of his information is very dated. It's incorrect. And he just, I feel like he's one of those guys who trying to give his advice causes more panic for a lot of people. He did say the right thing at the end there, though, with Jeremiah Johnson. Survivalism and wilderness survival, that is all a journey, and it does take a long time. It takes years to learn it. It takes, you know, not just reading a book and then going out in the wilderness once for a weekend and doing it. Um, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of doing it, and then if it ever does happen to you, it you'd be surprised how much you forget quickly, but it takes focus and skill to just get yourself through it. So, again, I'm being extra critical of Les Stroud because of the pandemic and some of the things he's said, and I just don't think he's a smart source of information for people in a survival situation. Go out and find yourself a real survival expert. Go to them. Ask them. They will help you. <laughs>